Hi everybody, welcome uh, to the next webinar in our series. Um, thank you for joining us again. Um, if, you, if you've been to one of our previous ones, um, hopefully you've seen some of the other events that we have and some of the other webinars and obviously welcome to attend any of those uh, culminating in our online conference later in the year. Um, today, uh, we've got Jonathan Lynch from the University of Maine who is the director of sports performance. Um, he'll be covering, uh, going, going quite in depth into areas of uh, stress uh, on the body and, and testing exercise prescription for that. Um, and he, he does a really good job and he'll be, he'll be answering some questions as well. And he'll, he'll let us know if he wants those kind of during it or, or wait till the end on that. So Jonathan will let us know on that. Um, also, thank you to our, our sponsors again for this, uh, Team Builder, uh, Output, Sports and Sound Probiotics, who help us put these events on for free. Um, I'll now pass over to Jonathan and uh, hope you enjoy the webinar today. Thank you. Hey guys, uh, just trying to get my video started here. Give me just a second. All right, there we go. Okay, thanks again for joining in. Uh, my name is John Lynch. I'm the Director of Sports Performance at the University of Maine. Um, today, I wanna to talk a little bit about testing and exercise prescription for stress management, hence the title of this slideshow. Um, I will get right into this. And first, before I do, I wanna just thank Andrew Langford. Thank you very much. I've been a part of the uh, International University Strength and Conditioning Association since its inception a few years ago. Um, the things that you guys have been able to do are uh, nothing short of extraordinary for the field of uh, sports performance. We've had a couple of interns who have uh, come over uh, from this organization who have been great and uh, just really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and uh, to all of our members today. So without further ado, um, understanding stress and I just think we have to define stress a little bit before we can talk too much more about um, how we want to test or anything else we want to do. So we're going to define stress. We're going to talk a little bit about a term called biotensegrity that I think is really important and potentially overlooked in this field. But what is stress? All right. And stress essentially is any input received by the brain, right? all senses. So whether that's a heavy squat, whether that's your sport practice, whether that's you know uh, your car getting a flat tire or you breaking up with your significant other, having a test, et cetera, all of those things contribute to stress. It's basically any disruption in homeostasis of the body, okay? Um, general adaptation syndrome just simply states, all right, Cellier 1946, you can see right there, that your body will adapt specifically to the stressor that's placed upon it. Okay, a lot of people know that, a lot of people know that. Um, but the reason that's important is because everything you do on a daily basis, you adapt to. For example, you all watching this slideshow right now are adapting to being better at listening to me talk over Zoom and watching a slideshow. That's how media it is. There are several factors to consider when you talk about stress, right? The first being 
psychoneuroimmunology, which is just a long term for how stress interacts or causes the endocrine system to react. You having that test, you getting that flat tire, those are just filling a bottle of stress. And when that thing gets to the top, you have an anxiety attack. You break down. There's nothing you can do, or at least you feel that way. Okay. But what dictates how fast that bottle fills? Trade anxiety. Okay. Trait anxiety is the concept of I can perceive a stressor different from somebody else, that exact same stressor. All right. So if that car had a flat tire and I really like that car, or if I wrecked that car and I really like that car, then that's going to bother me a lot more than if I didn't care. If it's an older car, if it's broken down and I wrecked that car, it's totaled. Fine. Maybe I'm actually happy because maybe I reap some benefits from the insurance company. But if that's a nice car and I just bought it, now I'm going to lose money. All right. So that's trait anxiety, how I actually perceive stress. All right. So I'll just bring this up. Perception is the key to stress. Trait anxiety compared to state anxiety being the instance of stress, whether it was that heavy squat or that car breaking down, whatever it might be, all right? Comparing those two things is gonna dictate how your body's reacting to whatever stress it is. And then on a longitudinal basis, acute versus chronic load ratio. All right. So how often is that stressor occurring? Is it a stressor that's way different from one that you've perceived in the past? Um, one example of this is people who don't, you know, you have a varsity athlete who hasn't done anything all summer and then they report to training camp in the fall. Well, that chronic load ratio is pretty low. And then when they show up to compete, now it's very high. Chances of injury are high. But if you've built into that, you know, for the last, 28 days or two or three months repeating, then you're ready, all right? And then finally, coping with stress, all right? And I think this is a really important point that a lot of people maybe don't have too good of an idea about, but essentially muscular tension and emotional tension of the body are simply one and the same. And that's a quote from Hazlitt. Um, and if you've heard anything about the teachings of re reflexive performance reset, um, what uh, JL and Cal Dietz are doing with that are uh, really nothing sort of uh, extraordinary. They'll teach you that. They'll tell you that if you are stressed, you're going to retain that stress muscularly. So in that sense, I like to think about it as stress is simply the data that is being stored by your muscle. Think of your muscle as uh, a, a computer hard drive with your brain being the random access memory that can do things in the present tense while muscularly you're holding stress in your body. All right. So moving on from that point is the next concept called biotensegrity. All right. So tensegrity was a term or is a term coined by Fuller in 1975 in the text Synergetics, right? Uh, Fuller, Buckminster Fuller was an architect, a designer. All right. And he coined this term tensegrity, talking about tensegrity structures, or simply a structure that was not, um, didn't only rely on compression to keep its shape. So for example, a compression structure would be a brick wall. You have one brick, there's another brick stacked on top and on top, and then gravity holds everything down. Well, if you took that brick wall, without the mortar, of course, and you put it in outer space, well, what happens? All these bricks start to float away from each other. Eventually, you have no wall. Well, a tensegrity structure is a structure that has components of compression and also of tension. And that's what your body is. That's how your body holds itself together. Your body in outer space stays intact, right? So uh, you can see kind of on the right, this is, um, this is an example from Myers, uh, 2009. The book is called Anatomy Trains. It's a very good text. I recommend uh, checking that out if you've never heard about it. But um, Myers, and I'll show you a little bit more from his book, he talk, talks about the body in terms of a tensegrity structure. So you can see the examples there on the right of the spine in the long picture. Uh, the top right is a hip and the bottom right is a foot or an ankle rather. And how those structures might be organized in a simpler 
fashion in terms of this biotensegrity with the compression structures or the, the sticks, if you will, being bones and the tension structures being fascia. Okay, so uh, on the picture on the left, you have two examples. You have balanced tension, that tensegrity structure um, without any outside influence that is simply symmetrical. All of those tension uh, components are equal and all of the compression components are equal. Then in uh, example B, you can see there's a hand pushing down and that's just creating a little bit of force. Well, that force is both compressing and expanding, okay? So it's compressing downward, but it's expanding outward. So in that same sense, you, you have the law of conservation of energy that's saying some of these tensegrity or some of these tension structures are being stretched while some of these uh, other tensegrity structures are being compressed. And that is how your body is going to act under stress. Okay, so we'll get past that. In terms of exercise technique, this becomes very important when we look at managing stress. We're going to talk a little bit about a neural threshold. And a neural threshold is a term that I use for determining when compensation is going to occur in a given exercise. That goes hand in hand with movement variability because movement variability is dictated off of stress. All right, and then we'll talk about reciprocal inhibition and the zone of apposition. So in terms of this neural threshold, Okay, this, think of the difference between a strength exercise and a power exercise. So you can see in this first gray box here in green are exercises that I would consider strength or endurance building exercises. And in red, explosive power or think of like training for performance exercise. Obviously, strength exercises are also used for performance, but bear with me. Okay, exercises that occur below a neural threshold, for example, recovery methods, you can see it right there, yoga, breathing techniques, any and all strength movements, or maybe a better way to say that is non-explosive lifts. And then above that neurological threshold are things like sport practice, sprinting, comp cutting, jumping, all right, power training, the Olympic lifts, throwing, things that require explosive force. So it's very simple. You can just think of that in terms of from the center of your body, if you, if you are directing muscular tension to move away from the center of your body in an explosive fashion, that would be above neural threshold. If you're directing it to move towards the center of the body in an implosive fashion, that would be below a neural threshold, okay? And the ability to control that is where the threshold exists. So we'll talk about this a little bit deeper as we get into the next slide. But the ultimate goal is balance between those two, being able to switch it on and explode, being able to switch it off and implode. And a great example of that is a clean or a snatch. Because when you pull that bar, when you explode up and shrug and pull, then your rib and your hip are moving apart from one another. Your back is contracting, you're shrugging, you're pulling with all your might, you're trying to be as explosive as you possibly can. And then when you catch the bar, you have to snap back into an implosive state in order to create stability in your core first and then outward toward the extremity. And that ability to switch from on and off, zero, one, black, white, whatever you wanna call it, is in fact movement variability. And you can see the quote from Carl Val, in 2019 right there, movement variability is the normal variation that occurs in motor performance across multiple repetitions of a task. And why multiple repetitions? Because you might do a bench press for 10 reps for 75% of your max, as long as the max is accurate, of course. And what do you experience? Well, those first one to five reps are probably pretty good. You're probably below that neurological threshold of compensation. You can probably keep your elbows in. You're probably pushing the bar straight up because you can hold pressure in your core. 
what happens on rep seven, rep eight, rep nine, when you're getting close to that relative max? Well, the rib starts to break. The low back contracts. You start to shrug. You push the bar over your face, your elbows twist out, and you might fail if you do too many reps, okay? But the point is this. The neural threshold is the point at which you have no more control, no matter how intentful you are, to change the, the uh, technique of that exercise. All right. So the argument that I would make is that in order to improve this neurological threshold, which is certainly a component of capacity, first and foremost, is to try to make type one muscle fibers more efficient within the ATP creatine phosphate system and type two muscle fibers more efficient oxidatively. And the key is reciprocal inhibition, okay? Reciprocal inhibition is both the problem and the solution. And here's why. If you look at the graph on the left, or I'm sorry, the image on the left, I should say, this simply shows how the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems interact with one another. Okay, we know that brain signals muscles to contract, muscles pull on bones, and that pull, that tensegrity, is gonna dictate posture. So within that tensegrity structure, if you have one muscle that is overcompensating or compensating and locking into a contracted state, then you have an equal and opposite muscle, usually an antagonist to that muscle, that is being pulled into a lengthened position. It's not off. It's contracting and holding on for dear life, okay? So within the uh, central nervous system, battling constantly between sympathetic and parasympathetic, snapping into that explosive force and pulling back into that implosive force. You can see that on the uh, sympathetic side on the left, ma many of that uh, those innervations are within the, the um, lumbar spine, okay, T1 to L3. Those uh, innervations are turning off the internal organs, okay? What they're also doing are turning on the muscles of the low back, the quadratus laborum, erector spinae, longissimus, and you can see that in the uh, illustration on the right. Conversely, the parasympathetic nervous system has virtually no innervations through the body, the spine, but they're in the cervical and in the sacral spine. Okay, doing the same thing, but activating those internal organs. So to the picture on the right now, and this simply is just displaying a typical lower cross and upper cross syndrome. What you're seeing is the red muscles are concentrically loaded. They're locked short, where the, the blue muscles are eccentrically loaded or locked long in a position of stress, in a position that is sympathetically driven. Okay, that thoracic spine innervation is kicking on. Imagine you're a caveman in the Sahara. You see the lion. What happens when you see the lion? You go, you, your body switches into sympathetic state. You don't have to do anything, it just happens. And you gotta know which way to go, or you gotta go, okay? So in that situation, you don't have time to think. It's a natural response, snap. Now, we're not cavemen on the Sahara, but we drive cars that might have a flat tire. We do 10 repetitions of bench press at 75%. And at some point, we are unable to avoid this neurological drive, this sympathetic drive, which is the neural threshold. So in that picture on the right with the lower cross syndrome, this is simply a person whose brain is perceiving stress at a high rate. The low back is tight, because the low back is tight, think of that tensegrity structure, the anterior core is inhibited. Reciprocal inhibition. How do you fix it? Go the other way. That's where the intent comes in. Fire the anterior core, relax the low back. So that's what we're gonna get into right now. In terms of functional anatomy, the zone of apposition or the space between the respiratory diaphragm that allows you to breathe, and the pelvic diaphragm that holds your internal organs in place 
you need to be able to hold pressure. So that is called the zone of apposition. I would consider this the keystone of the body and the postural restoration, restoration institute would do the same. Okay, so that's where many of these teachings are from. The abdominal wall is the outer wall of that canister of pressure. Internal obliques, external oblique, obliques, transverse abdominis, and serratus anterior, to name a few. When you are in an exhaled state, the ribs come down, the diaphragm domes up, and you have a controlled zone of apposition. When you are in an inhaled state, that diaphragm flattens, the ribs come up, your back extends, and you move into that zone on the right, sympathetic muscle activation, okay? And you can see it there. We, I'm, I'm calling this a chain reaction, and I'll show you on the next slide why. When you see that lion on the, on the Sahara, okay? Like I said, you don't have time to react. Your body snaps into this position. By doing so, it is automatically activating muscles that create explosive power in the body, okay? Spinal erectors, upper trap, scalene, okay? The diaphragm itself becomes a postural stabilizer to hold your body upright. Because the diaphragm is holding your body's posture, it can no longer work in respiration, nor should it because you can already breathe with these accessory muscles and the diaphragm is helping, is twisting and torquing and tilting your, di your uh, ribs and hips in order to create explosive force to save your life in that situation. Well, today we're not normally in life risking situations, but we still perceive those same stretches in those same ways, okay? The key is controlling the zone of apposition. In any exercise, if you are able to hold pressure between your diaphragms in that zone of apposition, you can control that zone of apposition. And this gives you access to muscles that you do not have access to in the same ranges of motion, in the same lengths as you do in the sympathetic drive, okay? And that is what a neural threshold is. So moving on, I called it a chain reaction, and here's why. And this is another uh, example from Meyer's uh, anatomy trains, okay? Or five examples. You can see these muscle chains, okay? Superficial front, back, the spiral line, the back functional line, the front functional line. Okay, so just take a glance at these. I'm not gonna get too deep into this, but I just want you to have an idea of kind of what this is talking about, okay? so. Take that superficial back line, for example. With a controlled zone of apposition, these muscles can work efficiently and effectively equally. The, the upper, the lower back, the hamstring, the calf, but this chain goes literally from the bottom of your feet, across your hips, shoulders back, skull, and to the front of your eyes, or to the front of your uh, forehead. Okay, that's a piece of fascia. The reason this is important is because you should treat these muscle chains the same way that you might treat joints. And you've probably heard that the ankle should be mobile, the knee should be stable, the hips should be mobile, the lumbar spine should be stable, the thoracic spine should be mobile, and up the chain. Okay, moves right up. The muscles work in the same way, off and on, mobile, stable, whatever you want to call it. When you have a broken zone of apposition and you cannot hold pressure in your core, the problem that you run into is that you can no longer activate the muscles in that chain equally, okay? Because when I cannot hold pressure in my core, that scissor angle breaks. My ribs raise up, my hips anteriorly tilt. Well, when that posture changes, so does the leverages and the length tension relationship in the rest of the muscles of the body. If I'm trying to bench press and my back comes off the bench or my hips come off the bench, that happens because it makes me a little bit stronger at the bench press.
but it also makes me much less efficient functionally because I'm only bench pressing so I can put my feet in the ground and push against somebody else. Well, if I don't have a good zone of apposition and I'm pushing against somebody else, the tension doesn't go through my core into the ground. It goes out somewhere else and I probably get beat in that block or in that situation. So in that same sense, without the ability to hold the zone of apposition, the muscles in this example of the superficial back line are asymmetrical. Okay, back to that lower cross syndrome. When the sympathetic nervous system kicks on, you're going to have muscles of this lumbar spine that are concentrically activated to stabilize the posture. Well, what does that do to the hamstring? The, if these muscles are contracting and pulling inward, then it's simply just pulling against that muscle chain. So you can pretty well assume that if you have an extended low back, then your hamstring is going to be at risk, is going to be in a deficit position. Your hamstring is going to be eccentrically loaded. You can fix this with reciprocal inhibition the same way that you can agonist antagonist from front to back or in a different chain. It works within the same chain as well. So in a simple um, example, if I'm asked, if I'm being asked to squat, I'll step back a minute. If I'm being asked to squat and my back is extended like this and the bar on my back, then I might be better at squatting because my back, which is the weakest point in that movement, is going to be at, a, at an improved leverage. But you better not ask me to bend my knees over my toes in the same situation because if you do, then I'm going to have trouble since my hamstring cannot support my knee in that position. And then you wonder why the Nordics you're doing aren't improving your hamstring health and you still have hamstring pulls. Fix the zone of apposition first. And that applies, certainly we could talk about this one slide for a long time. That applies through all three planes of motion in, and also uh, in spiral lines. So this spiral line, just remember this because we're gonna come back to this at the end of the uh, presentation but this spiral line particularly is very, very important in terms of athletic performance. Okay. When you talk about the zone of apposition and being able to hold pressure, that is a function of capacity. I would argue that conditioning or capacity or strength endurance or the ability to hold a position below a neurological threshold for an extended period of time is the single most important trait in athletics. Because by doing that, and this is the kind of the key to this presentation, by holding tension in that zone of apposition and creating that pressure and being able to keep it, you will not compensate, okay? And that is willpower, that is hard to do. So in this example, conditioning plus willpower yields neural threshold. You want to increase the neural threshold as far as possible, as high up into that relative intensity spectrum as possible in order to be the best athlete you can possibly be. Back to the bench press example. If I'm bench pressing that 10 reps to 75% and I get to three or four reps before I get to this position, or if I can't even get out of this position, then I have no zone of apposition and I am working solely under compensatory uh, leverages, okay? So in that example, or really in any example uh, along those lines, the neural threshold is the key, okay? I want to be able to float like a butterfly in an oxidative sense and sting like a bee in a phosphogenic sense, okay? I wanna be able to hold that position for as long as I have to. And then when it's time to strike, I want to explode, strike, and implode and get right back. I wanna switch it on and switch it off. And that can happen in you know, 30 seconds of you throwing five punches. That can happen over the course of five snatches. That can happen over the course of you doing a 30-30 uh, circuit with 10 exercises that are very complex, okay? If you cannot hold the zone of apposition, you will be in pain. You will be in compensation 
you will have fatigue much faster. And as a result, you will break down. All right, so to the Bruce Lee quote, and this kind of sums it up. This is one of my favorite quotes. But you must be shapeless, formless, like water. You can pour water into a cup, it becomes the cup. When you pour water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. When you pour water into a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Water can drip and it can crash. Become like water, my friends. So how do we know? Performance testing, okay? We're gonna talk about energy system assessments because capacity matters a whole lot. We're gonna talk about monitoring training loads and then diaphragm efficiency, okay? So here are a few examples of some of the tests we do to figure out where our athletes are at the University of Maine, all right? These are baseline tests and we're gonna test these a number of times throughout the year to make sure that we're improving. The ATP system, okay, that immediate energy system. Vertical jump, broad jump. What's the difference? Are you better at one than the other? How much better? Is it enough that we have to address it? 20, 40, 60 yard sprints. We'll usually take the split. We'll run one bout and take the three splits off it just to save some energy and time. Max velocity, okay? This is important for return to play. I'll just, I'll jump to the right right now. We test the sprint for return to play. The same reason we test most of these others. Because if we have an athlete who gets injured and can't condition for a couple of weeks, then they have to enter a reacclimatization protocol to address the energy system deficits that occurred when they were injured. If you have an athlete who has had labrum surgery, or even, we'll, we'll back up. If you had an athlete who had an AC joint sprain, okay, not even a grade three, but maybe a grade one or two, can that same athlete, a couple of days later, once the swelling goes down, can they run a 20, 40, 60 yard sprint and reach 90% of what they ran when they were healthy? Definitely not. So it works for upper body injuries as well as lower. But we wanna know when they're back before we put them back into practice, okay? Energy system profiling. And this applies a little bit more to anaerobic and aerobic, but we certainly wanna compare those to the ATP system. Fast and slow glycolysis, okay? Just a couple examples. A fast glycolysis is a 60 yard shuttle, Okay, five back, 10 back, 15 and back. It's somewhere between 12 or 15 seconds, depending on the athlete. And we'll run it about six times in the one to four work to rest. That will tell you where the drop-off is, which is what you're really looking for, okay? And then slow glycolysis is just an example of that is a 300 yard shuttle. Whether you're running it at 25 yard turn or 50 yard turn, or really doesn't matter. Or quite frankly, as long as you're getting into that minute range, which is why we like that, the, the modality really does not matter. But running that shuttle for three reps with a one to three work to rest will tell you how good your anaerobic system is. And then aerobically, a test that we really like because it's low impact and we can run it with a lot of different athletes is simply a modified Cooper. We have a Kaiser M3i, which is a spin bike, and we'll run it, men gear 16, females gear 14, six minutes on, tracking distance and going basically as far as they can in six minutes. We're gonna look at the distance they can cover. We're gonna look at their heart rate. We track it with a Polar Team uh, Pro system, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. And then we're gonna look at their recovery one minute after. Because I don't just care about what they're able to achieve, but I care about what they were able to achieve and then how fast they were able to recover from that achievement. Because those things happen fractally, meaning that the same rate that you're able to recover between your shuttles, and the same level that your heart rate you're gonna be able to recover to in a minute is going to be fractally um, relatable to your acute to chronic load ratio. What you can do in a day is very similar to what you can do in a month and simply improving after that. So we wanna see the return to play. We wanna see the energy system profiling. But really for us, we wanna know if we're doing a good job with that athlete. So we're gonna look at longitudinal career progress. We wanna build normative values. We wanna see if our athletes are, what our athletes are normally coming in at on an average. So we know if we get an athlete who's way below that average or way above that average, 
And then we want to make sure that as they go through freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year, that they're getting better. It's really important to monitor the training load. It, you don't have to have an official monitoring system to do this, but you do have to monitor the training load. And the reason that a monitoring system like a, a Team Pro or a Catapult or a First Beat are great are because the relationship between external load metrics and internal load metrics, and you can see it on this slide, but an external load metric would be what was on paper, okay? What was the total volume? Did you run um, a 50 yard sprint 10 times? Okay, that's 500 yards. Okay, we know the sets times reps times load usually is body weight and conditioning. Um, or with a, with a monitoring system, it's not always. You can see the heart rate ranges that people are in. You can see the speed zones people are in and you can get some really good information otherwise. But those things are gonna tell you local muscle demand on paper, okay? External load metrics, how many accelerations, decelerations you did, the speed zones you ran in. But then what we really care about is the internal load metric, which without this, you have virtually no way to track unless you're doing some type of blood lactate test or at a minimum, I guess, checking, uh, you know, a 15 minute or 15 second, um, you know, self heart rate test. But you need to figure out what actually happened because it's, it's, it's very different to write an exercise or a, a training session on paper than it is to see the actual impact of that because having athletes whose trait anxiety is different will affect those athletes differently. My offensive linemen who's running those uh, 10 sprints are, are going to have a different training impact, TRIMP, T-R-I-M-P, than my skill players. They're going to run slower, but quite honestly, they will have a lower heart rate range because of their sport pathology or what they're being asked to do on a regular basis in the sport they play. The skill players, the more explosive players, the players who run a long way in a certain uh, instance and then take a long rest, and when they run, they run as fast as possible, are going to be burning hotter. They're going to be at a higher heart rate range. Right? So that's why those things are important. It's important to look at acute to chronic workload ratio, and it's important to quantify local muscle stress. And if you don't have access to a monitoring system, then I highly recommend you figure out a way to differentiate at, from one athlete to another. Maybe it's just simply RPE of what those workouts are doing. And then finally here, we want to talk about inspiratory muscle training. To me, this concept is really at the tip of the iceberg in terms of the sports performance world. Some people are doing some really great things with this. Some people have never heard of it. Okay. So this is uh, the top right. That's the Pro 2 device. Um, it's a pretty good, good piece of equipment. Um, but I've used this personally, and I've trained athletes using this. But what you see in the graph, and I'll just quickly explain how this works, is you would take a seated position where you can kind of round your back so that you know that you're not getting um, any compensatory muscle activation, or at least you can minimize the compensatory muscle activation upon inhaling. So you sit down, you exhale as far as possible. When you exhale, your diaphragm domes, okay? You insert the device into your mouth, and then you inhale. When you inhale, you try to inhale only using your diaphragm. Certainly can be tricky at first, especially for these people who have high trait anxiety, or if you just did a heavy back squat, probably not a good idea to try this for the first time because you're gonna be pretty jacked up, you'll be pretty sympathetic, okay? But what this does, you inhale, and when you inhale, you try to inhale as hard as you possibly can without extending, shrugging, or any of the others, any of the like. And then you inhale and you draw air in as long as possible, okay? This is training the diaphragm. This is training the diaphragm to have better strength endurance. So in the picture, you can see MIP, max inspiratory pressure from week one to week 10 had increased significantly the same way that when you first start working with a client or a group of athletes, you're going to get neurological improvement right away and strength improvement later. 
Okay. So within those 10 weeks, you can see the drastic increase from this chart. And then we care about two other things. One, the space under the graph, which is essentially total lung volume, because when you're extended, your diaphragm is flat. When you're sympathetic, your diaphragm is flat. And when your diaphragm is flat, you have a very limited ability to bring more air into your lungs because you already are in inhaled state. But when you exhale, not only does your diaphragm dome, but you get inhibition of compensatory muscle, compensatory breathing muscle particularly, okay? That shuts off that chain reaction of sympathetic mode and brings you into a parasympathetic state. The amount of space under the graph is the amount of air you can breathe in. So if you can breathe in more air per breath, then you probably have better oxygen exchange. Okay? You have more oxygenated air in your lungs because you have a greater total volume or tidal volume. You have a lesser residual volume. You can breathe out further. The stale air is gone and the sympathetic muscle activation has been turned off. One other thing that I do want to point out on this slide is as you look at the graph, okay, and you see these little hitches and, re and spikes in the graph when you're breathing in, these spikes are um, essentially points at which you pull sympathetically, okay? So hard to know without being the person doing this, uh, this rep, but you inhaling here, this might be an upper trap activating. This might be uh, a QL activating. This might be an upper trap activating because that's really pulling, okay? So as you get through this, uh, the end of this rep, you're gonna start to see more and more of these heavy juts of inspiration coming from sympathetic muscle activation because you are trying to get as much air as possible into your uh, lungs. So you, you will see this, but, Minimizing, having a flat curve that goes all the way down is a way to maximize the zone of apposition because you know that you can hold pressure in your core. So by doing this training, you will improve the zone of apposition. You will improve diaphragm strength endurance. And as you can see in bold and underlined at the bottom, movement variability, which is really the key. Okay. So I really want to bring this back now um, and here's the big picture, sacred geometry. And please, if you have questions, we'll answer those right when we're done. We have a couple more slides left. Sacred geometry is awesome. And if you have never looked into this, you should definitely look into this because for strength conditioning and sports performance, or really for <laughs> quite honestly, the vast majority of um, people who are trying to learn is really cool. Uh, but we'll get to that. And then, and then finally, a biometric leverage analysis, which is a test that we are starting to develop here at the University of Maine. So what is sacred geometry? Sacred, okay? I wanna just quickly reference the Vitruvian man, the Leonardo da Vinci, 14th century. Okay, you can see the picture on the right with a couple different squiggly lines and arrows drawn over it. We'll get to what that means. But essentially what we're talking about here in the Vitruvian man is simply proportions. The Vitruvian man, is the per architecturally perfect human based on gravity. Gravity is a constant, 9.8 meters per second squared. And this model is building proportions for that perfect architectural human, okay? So just quickly to name a few, and there's a whole list of these, so you can look this up, but from the chin to the top of the head should be optimally one eighth of the total height of the person. From the nipples to the top of the head should be one quarter of the total height. And from the beginning of the genitals to either the top of the head or to the feet should be one half of the total height. And there are many more. And as you can see on that picture on the right, okay, on the top right in pink. Sacred geometry is the golden ratio, pi, 1.618 repeating. It's like pi and it's an imaginary number. Essentially. And you can see in the bottom left there, description. Okay, and there's a few different descriptions because this is until you really research this. And even for me, who's, who I've done quite a bit of research, it's a tough concept to grasp. Okay, but phi, okay, is 
A plus B is to A as A is to B, as you can see on the top left. If you look at the model on the bottom left, which is maybe a little bit easier to understand, phi equals one plus one over one plus one over one plus one over repeated, okay? So that rectangle just to the right of those equations um, kind of illustrate what phi is, okay? So if you took a, um, a rectangle where A plus B is to A as A is to B, that would give you the right dimension of that rectangle. And then you cut it where A meets B. Well, that smaller rectangle gives you another proportional rectangle. And it simply repeats in this spiral line. Okay, so that's, I hope I did a good job of explaining. That. But you can see examples of this sacred geometry in all types of nature, including the human body, which is what we're getting at. So here's an example of a weather pattern and you can see the wind spiraling. Here's an example, and I just like fractally to show you how this infiltrates all pieces of, uh, of matter, but this is a universe. Maybe it's our universe. You can see the same pattern, a whirlpool. You can see the same pattern, a rose. If you look at a tree, you'll notice that as the tree grows, it never grows straight. It grows in a spiral straight up. You'll also notice that if you look at the branches, they don't ever come out in the same place. They come out in a pattern. Usually it's about 155 degrees around the trunk before the next limb comes out. Well, guess what? The human body is no different. Okay, so as you can see with that Vitruvian man, you can see that spiral line right over it. And if you just, if you just Google Fibonacci sequence or any of these golden ratio or anything like that, you will see plenty of examples of what I'm talking about here. So what we have done, what we are trying to do at the University of Maine is build out a biometric leverage analysis based off of this Vitruvian model. We are in beta. We are in beta. <laughs> we probably will be in beta for a long time. Okay. But here's what it is. All right. We want to look at athlete joint leverages. So just quickly, this is a uh, American football quarterback. He throws the ball. All right. What you're seeing with these diagonal lines is for the upper body proportions of the Vitruvian model. Okay, and I had to design this myself. But basically, where this furthermost uh, diagonal line lines up should match up with this athlete's middle finger first knuckle. Okay, it doesn't. His arm is long. The second line should line up at the wrist and the third line should line up at the elbow, shoulder, and this line should hit somewhere near his ear, okay? So what can I tell about this person regarding uh, his proportions compared to what's perfect for gravity? Well, he's long, he's long in the arm. There are also, without putting it on here, we can look at his head height, his top of his head to his nipples and so forth to figure out his vertical uh, symmetry, all right? But just simply, we can see that this first line at his middle finger does not match. His arm is longer. The second line does not match and it's even further off and it's longer. Well, his elbow is pretty close. So for this athlete, when we look at this athlete, we know one, he's probably a quarterback because of this, but also, when he starts to present issues with an elbow, with a shoulder, with a hand, which he might, and he actually hasn't yet, but I'm telling you he might, then we have some clues to go off of, all right? So we want to compare joint leverages, like this example, with the pathology of the sport. What movements does this person do on a regular basis? Because the principle of specificity, specificity and general adaptation syndrome say that what this guy does on a normal basis, he will adapt to. We want to take that and lay it over the pathology of stress, Myers anatomy traits. Because if we can figure out when he doesn't have a great zone of apposition, where does the stress go based on his sport and his joint leverages? then we get a lot of clues to where this athlete is going to have problems when he starts to get into chronic fatigue. Remember, 
acute to chronic workload ratio will dictate for the most part when this person is going to experience sympathetic drop. So if he goes four or five weeks without a deload, then he will be overreaching or overtraining. And when he's overreaching or overtraining, he will not be able to hold pressure in his zone of acquisition because his sympathetic nervous system will be ramped up and it will be activating the muscle, muscles of his low back and breaking them. So the energy system deficit compared to the stress pathology, the sport pathology, and the joint leverages in this athlete are going to dictate when and where he has problems because his body is simply a tensegrity structure that his brain is manipulating based on the events that he has been through and being asked to complete in order to com uh, compensate for those events. So that is the presentation. This is the last slide. And those are the concepts that I hope I've had the ability to bridge the gap between and explain how they relate to one another. So at this point, I would like to open the floor for any questions that you all may have about the content that I have just displayed. Crickets. <laughs> well, if there are no questions, I do sincerely thank everyone for taking part into this uh, presentation. Oh, here we go. Here's something. But anyway, I do thank you. Um, what would be a simple way to start with stress management, like meditation or sleep? Yes, certainly. Um, so just sleep. I think you know, for me with my athletes, I always preach sleep. I say, if we're not getting at least seven and a half hours of sleep, then we are uh, way behind the ball. And seven and a half hours is based off sleep cycles. If you know that in general, one sleep cycle is about an hour and a half, then that would be five sleep cycles. Um, and so nine is even better, obviously. But if you're not sleeping, then that's the same thing as having very poor endurance or very poor, low capacity, okay? If you're not sleeping, then you are closer to that compensation pattern, uh, essentially any and all the time, all right? Um, without getting too deep into the physiological effects of lack of sleep. Meditation is a, a great way to make your brain feel safe. So back to that uh, example of the caveman on the Sahara, that lion is going to make you feel threatened. What meditation does is it allows your body to feel as if it is in a safe place and you perceiving, remember perception is important. You perceiving the environment as being safe allows you to switch into a parasympathetic state. Thank you for that question. How do you envision this leverage analysis system being utilized in clinical practice, say 10 years from now? Hey, it's a great question. Um, it, you know, the technology is something that is really um, critical for this, I think. I've kind of messed around with uh, taking pictures of athletes and plotting points on their arm, or elbows and wrists and knees and ankles. Um, but it's just pretty clunky and I don't have a great algorithm for it yet. I think that you know, hopefully that can be developed. And then once that's developed, you know, it can be it to the point where you simply stand in front of a graph or who knows with, the, with the systems like uh, elite form or, you know, these, these rack mounted 3d cameras, maybe it's even a situation where like you have a camera that's uh, that you can stand under for 10 seconds and it takes a picture of you. And um, you know, you can kind of determine all these things just simply based on the biomechanics. And then one other thing that I didn't really get into, but I do have a, a, a pretty cool concept for is lung volume. And as you, as you lose the zone of apposition, then your lungs 
are expanded. Okay, you're going into an inhaled state. So one of the thoughts also that I've got are, is that it may be possible to take a X-ray of sorts of the lung volume itself. You'd have to have a 3D picture, but if you could take a 3D picture of a fully inhaled lung and a fully exhaled lung, then you would have two uh, examples to compare that would show you where the rib and hip position is and the shape of that bolus of air in your lung may be able to determine what that pathology uh, is that occurs um, along those muscle chains. So I hope that makes sense. Thank you, great question. Uh, cool, how do you implement inspiratory muscle training? Within a training session, you just implement it within an exercise itself, such as a squat. So yeah, one easy way is the cue breathing. Um, and you can kind of reference the Posture Re Restoration Institute on this. They've got a, real, a lot of really good methodologies for um, respiration when you're training. Um, one of which is simply exhale all the way. Um, when you breathe in, reach. But you can find those pretty quickly if you, if you do some uh, research on that. They've also got some uh, techniques where you're uh, blowing up balloons. So that's another really great way. That's, uh, that's exhalation. But think of it in terms of exhalation trains the muscles specifically of the zone of apposition, like your uh, external oblique, internal oblique, transverse abdominis, et cetera, serratus anterior. So those muscles being able to fire improve the zone of apposition which improve the diaphragm's ability to dome, which would be kind of the other side of the spectrum here. The diaphragm's ability to, to flatten is kind of dictated on its ability to dome because if it can't dome, then it can't flatten. So it's the same thing as being able to squat down all the way or bench press all the way, all right? Um, you can certainly use the Pro, in terms of using the Pro 2 specifically, uh, I've had athletes who, we're on maybe a three time a week or, or every day where they would come in independently of a training session and do the exercise. You could certainly set it up like a readiness um, screen where athletes would do one breath a day or multiple, like two or three breaths a day. And whether or not they could reach a certain max inspiratory pressure or a certain tidal volume should be able to dictate what position sympathetically that their, their body is in to where if it's lower, you would be able to do a low CNS fatigue day or if it's higher to do a high CNS fatigue day. Thank you, great question. Uh, have you compared this data to game performance data? For example, the QB, did his past completion percentage improve? And we simply have not gotten there yet. No, I, what I can tell you is um, we have used some of this data, particularly um, in terms of body fat, so we'll, we'll measure body fat every couple of weeks. And athletes who are, over the course of the season, slowly decreasing in body fat, we know that they are mostly recovering, okay? Because if they stop, if they stop recovering, then they start to retain body fat as a result of overreaching. So I know that's a little bit of a backwards way to look at this, and it doesn't necessarily relate to um, these specific examples of that leverage analysis, I would say this, this is more for injury prevention, not necessarily performance. So performance wise, you would probably want to track, uh, readiness if you could, uh, and body fat and body weight, because if you know that body fat is decreasing and body weight is either increasing or staying relatively the same, that you are going to be in a, you'll be certainly in a catabolic state when you're performing, but you'll at least be in an anabolic state when you're not performing. And that's critical because when you are overreaching, then you are in a catabolic state far more often than you are in an anabolic state. All right, so that would be my answer to that. In terms of performance. We really haven't started to bridge that gap yet. I think that this is more in terms of uh, health and, and uh, stress management, but I have no doubt that an athlete who is healthier and less stressed would perform better. 
Uh, let's see here, uh, Aiden. So great presentation. Thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, have you come across any common injuries or indicators with the sacred geometry that you've been looking into maybe between same sport athletes? Um, not necessarily with sacred geometry. I think that's, uh, I think that's a way to build out um, predispositions, but we are just simply building out clues, right? And so that's what I meant by we're in beta. Right now we are collecting data on this. We are looking at lever lengths. We are saying, do people with a longer torso tend to have more oblique issues, tend to have more groin issues, tend to have more low back issues as a predisposition based simply on leverage? Do basketball players tend to have uh, more shoulder issues because they're constantly, one, their arms are longer, but they're constantly reaching out or overhead? Um, ankle issues is a good one. Obviously, that's a contact issue a lot of times. But um, yeah, to be totally honest with you, we haven't made any definitive conclusions yet, but we are certainly building out our database and looking for those conclusions. So yeah, to answer your question, no, but they are certainly there. Thank you for the question. Um, looks like we're starting to slow down here. Give it a few more seconds. So great. Thanks again, everybody. I really appreciate, appreciate you um, taking part in this live. Uh, this will also be up on uh, the IUSCA website for everybody to view as it has been recorded. But thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And hopefully this has helped you um, see things in a little bit of a different way. And we started to bridge the gap between stress management, uh, sport pathologies, and you've gotten some ideas on testing. So thank you again very much. Uh, Andrew, IUSCA, uh, also really appreciate the opportunity, um, and I love everything you guys are doing, so thank you. Thanks, John. I'm sure, I'm sure everyone will join me in, in thanking you for that. It was uh, a really, really informative, and, and I certainly learned a few, few new things and, and, and got something to take away and research there, so thanks a lot for that. Um, like John said, it'll be, the recording will be up online. Um, probably in the next week in the next seven days in the members area on the website so you know feel free to go back in and, and have a look at that um and I'm, I'm not sure if john's willing to be reached reached out on uh, twitter or, or email or anything but yeah sure thing um at jay lynch spc on twitter uh and you can certainly if you go to goblackbears.com you can pull up my uh, email address and actually my cell phone number's on there too. So hit me up if you guys have any questions or if you want to uh, talk more about that. GoBlackBears.com. It's the University of Maine Athletics website. Great. Well, that uh, that'll finish us up for for today. Um, check out all of the other other webinars we have coming up, and and like I say, the um, conference at the at the end of summer as well. So thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot, John. And um, see everyone again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much.